Man, we're so honored today to have um, one of the, the preeminent leaders in the world who happens to be a brother in Christ uh, coming up to speak to us. John ha has authored 14 books. He's about to come out with his 15th book in two weeks. His books are um, leadership style books that have really changed the world. Uh, his clients include the Atlanta Falcons, the LA Clippers, uh, Campbell Soup, we you know, West Point Academy. I mean, this is a man who travels around the world and, and uh, on any given day will meet with the executive team at Southwest Airlines and then speak to their entire team as they come together. Uh, but outside of just being a great leader who, who walks into environments like Clemson football and works with coaches there and those kind of things, he also shares a common faith with us. And um, a guy who speaks all the time uh, telling you this morning that he's a little nervous because he's going to talk about things he's never talked about before. Uh, I don't know about you, it makes me want to lean in and see what he has to say. Come on, let's put our hands together for the great John Gordon, everybody. Thank you, David. Thank you. Thank you. I'm so honored to be here. Every time I come back, which is my third time being back, my faith grows more and more because I survived the flight at the Lynchburg Airport. <laughs> but it's, it's such a, a special place. It's such a, a meaningful place to me, and it's an honor to be able to, to share my faith today. And even though I, I talk a lot about positive leadership, I talk a lot about building winning teams, and I'm not really going to talk about those topics today. I think it's ironic that I'm known for that because I'm not naturally positive. I grew up in Long Island, New York. Yeah, in a Jewish-Italian family, a lot of food, a lot of guilt. A lot of wine, a lot of whining. My grandmother, she was terrified of flying, and any time we would go on a flight, she would often say to me, Jonathan, you know when they say your time is up, your time is up, but I don't want to be in a plane when someone else's time is up. My dad was a New York City police officer, undercover narcotics. He was shot a few times. He wasn't too big on positive energy, my dad. He was a very loving man, but just the most negative guy on the planet. You'd get up in the morning, you'd say, hey, good morning, dad. He'd say, what's so good about it? My dad was Al Bundy before Al Bundy was Al Bundy. I just realized most of you have no idea who Al Bundy is. <laughs> My dad grew up Catholic, but we, you know, we never went to church. We never went to temple. We never did any of that. I was actually bar mitzvah. I believed in, in God, but I just didn't have a relationship with him. And then after college, I moved down to Atlanta, and I remember Atlanta? All right. All right. I remember going to Atlanta and then getting a bartending job at one of the hottest places in Atlanta. And I remember working at the bar, bartending, and seeing my parents walk in the door, and I'll, I'll never forget my mother's face as I stood on the bar pouring shots in people's mouths. She was so proud of me. <laughs> Actually, she was devastated. I could still see that look on her face. It was a, a look of, of despair, like, what have I done wrong? What is going to become of my son? What is he going to become? And if I could go back in that moment, I would tell her what I would tell my younger self, what I will tell you now, stay positive. God has a plan. We were back, we were back earlier backstage and the, the power went out. I thought, that's okay, my talk today is stay positive, God has a plan. After that, I became a, uh, a teacher. I got a master's in teaching, I, I started teaching. And then I eventually opened up a bar of my own in the same area where I had worked. I also uh, got involved in politics. I ran for city council. I started a nonprofit organization that raised money for youth-focused charities. But in city council, I walked door to door to 7,000 houses. I lost the election. I thought my life was over. But sometimes you have to lose a goal to find your destiny. And then I went to go to law school. I went there for a year and a half. I walked out after my second year exams. I literally walked out knowing that this is not the right place for me. And I got a job at a, a dot com, 
And so now I'm working at this dot com, think I'm going to make my millions, but the dot com starts to, to crumble, starts to fall apart, and I, I lose my job. And at that moment, my life starts to fall apart. My wife and I were fighting all the time. I was so full of fear and stress and worry. I didn't know what the, the future held, and I was being really negative a lot, and my wife had had enough. She gave me an ultimatum. She said, you have to change or our marriage is over. She said, I love you, but I'm not going to spend my life with someone who is making me miserable all the time. And I knew I needed to change. And I was a spiritual seeker. I had meditated. I had practiced, you know, Buddhism. But for that moment, that first time, I literally cried out to God. I said, God, why am I so miserable? Why am I here? I, I know I'm here for a reason, God. I know that you have a plan for me. I know you have a purpose for me. And in that moment, I'll never forget, writing and speaking came to me. I never wrote and spoke before, but that's what came to me. So I started to write this weekly newsletter, these positive tips, and I started to share these positive tips out with friends. My mother, my brother, my best friend from college, they were getting the newsletter whether they liked it or not. And then I started to walk and pray. Each day I would just take these walks of gratitude and, and prayers, just asking God for guidance. I opened up a Moe's Southwest Grill in Jacksonville. Yes, yeah, second mortgage, our home, $20,000 in credit cards put everything we had into this restaurant, didn't know if it was going to make it or not. I mean, if it didn't make it, we were in big trouble. But I saw how God carried us during that time. That's where my, my faith was born. And then a couple years later, a friend of mine gave me these sermons from Erwin McManus, where he talked about why I follow Jesus. And for the first time, I heard the voice of Jesus through Erwin. And then I was listening to a sermon from Rob Bell called Covered in Dust about Jesus as a Jewish rabbi, and that really spoke to me. And I remember saying this prayer, God, if there is something to this Jesus, just show me the signs. I'm open, just show me the signs. And God started to show me the signs. He literally showed me the signs on I-4 that said Jesus is the answer. <laughs> Happened so often, I'd be driving down, I'd be looking to the left, and I'd hear, look, I turned to the right, and there would be the sign, Jesus is the answer. I recently drove down that same road, and there's another sign there that says, Jesus is still the answer. While I was praying, I started to see a, a glowing cross. The more I learned about Jesus, I realized that I needed a Savior because I couldn't save myself. I was baptized in 2006, and the experience changed my life. Thank you. Jesus changed my life, he changed my heart, he changed my soul, he changed my spirit, changed my marriage, he changed my family, my kids, he changed everything. I don't drink now. I'm not Baptist, I just don't drink. <laughs> and I know that my mom would be proud that I'm here with you today if she was alive, and she'd be so thankful that I'm speaking to you instead of standing on a bar pouring shots in people's mouths. You see, Jesus changes everything. And that's why I'm a little nervous today, because I don't really often share my testimony. I often talk about positive leadership and, and building winning teams, but I thought it was too important not to share it. Because in 2006, around that same time that I was baptized, I also was taking a lot of walks of prayer because the writing and speaking wasn't going well. See, I had opened up the Mo's hoping it, it would allow me the the economic, you know, viability to be able to write and speak. And so I then sold the Mo's to focus 100% on writing and speaking. God said it's time to sell, so I sold. But now it's not going well. And I'm taking this walk and I'm really thinking about just giving up, like, okay, I'm just going to give up. It's, it's not working, it's not happening. And on that walk, God gave me the energy bus, the story for the energy bus. I went home to my home office and I started writing this book. I wrote it in three and a half weeks of just God's inspiration. He gave me the vision, and each day I would take a walk of prayer. He would give me more and more of the story. It was one of the most spiritual experiences of my life. I'll never forget that time and how God showed me the way on, on that journey. 
I have to be honest and let you know that I really do write my own books. People often ask me if I have a ghostwriter. I get asked that so often, I must not look smart enough to write a book. But I tell them, I don't have a ghostwriter, I have a holy ghostwriter. And God inspires me of what I'm meant to write. And so I had this book, now I had this book, The Energy Bus, and it's, it's uh, something that meant a lot to me, but a lot of publishers did not see my vision for it. It was rejected by over 30 publishers. I remember getting a call from my agent just saying, John, give up. It's not going to happen. But I, I couldn't give up because God had given me a vision to inspire and empower as many people as possible, one person at a time. I couldn't give up. And so I kept on hoping, I kept on dreaming, I kept on praying. And now, finally, the book gets accepted by a publisher and now it's coming out. I prayed for it to be a bestseller. It came out, it was a bestseller in Korea. <laughs> it was this huge hit in Korea, but not one bookstore in the United States would carry the book. Not one bookstore. So I decided to go on a 28-city tour, paid for it myself. Sometimes we're waiting on God, but God is waiting on us. And I felt called to just go and go share this message. And so I went from city to city sharing the message in the book. I had a good friend, Daniel Decker, and he was calling all the radio stations and TV stations in different cities where I was going to, and he said, hey, John Gordon's coming. Yes, he's internationally known, which was true because I was really big in Korea. And so they would have me on their shows, and then we would do these events at night, but we had five people come in one city. We had 10 people come in another. We had 20 people in another. And the most people we had were 100 people in Des Moines, Iowa. They thought Jeff Gordon was coming. That's why they showed up. <laughs> I got home, and I was just so exhausted, so tired. I walked in the door, and, and I, I collapsed. My wife was right there. I had been away from my family for a while. I had two young children. You know you're with the right person when they give you strength. And my wife was so supportive. And in that moment, I didn't know what my future held, but I knew who held my future. And I remember just in that moment just feeling like God had a plan. And looking back, I can see that a principal I met on the road led to a speaking engagement in a school. I met a business person which led to a talk for a business. I met a friend who gave the book to Jack Del Rio and started working with the Jacksonville Jaguars that year. And that brought me into the sports world. And then slowly but surely, the book started to spread. It didn't become a bestseller for five or six years. But here we are now, 10 years later, and I get to speak to you today. The greatest students, one of the greatest places on the face of this earth, I get to share with you today. Think about that. The book has gone on to sell over a million copies. All my books have sold probably over three, three million copies. And I don't tell you that to be impressed with me at all, because I don't think I'm impressive at all. I tell you that because I want you to be impressed with God. I want you to know what God could do through you. I share with you my story. So you look at your story. So you look inside with yourself and know that, that God has a plan for you. Where you are now is not where you're going to be. No matter what your situation is, no matter what challenging situation you are facing, no matter what obstacle you are facing, God has a plan for you. Our job is to stay positive and trust in that plan. See, you were born to do great things. When I ask people, do you want to be great? Do you want to do great things? Everyone says yes. I never heard anyone say, I want to be average, because God planted that in your heart and your soul to pursue greatness, to strive for greatness, because you were never meant to be average. He made you in his likeness and image. And Jesus said, even greater things than I shall you do. And yet we have this feeling of wanting to do great things, but we also often get a vision from God that makes us feel inadequate. And so we have this tension between wanting to do great things and yet this feeling of being inadequate as we pursue this vision. But that's so that we will find faith on our journey. That's so we will seek God and know that we can't do it alone. So as you strive for greatness, know that you can't be great without God's greatness. Thank you. 
but also know that when he gives you a vision, you go. Because God doesn't give you a roadmap. He gives you a north star and says, move. He doesn't give you a set of plans. He gives you himself. God never said it would be easy. He said, I will be with you. And so on this journey, we stay positive and we trust in God's plan for our life. I want to share with you a story. I think this is a really great analogy for life. My family and I, we were traveling from Jacksonville, Florida, where we live now, Jacksonville. And we were going to Maine, first time ever going to Maine. We were connecting in the Philadelphia airport. We arrived an hour and a half late for our connecting flight. We landed in Terminal A and we we're, were leaving from Terminal F. And I know in Philly you have to connect at C-16, which is really far from A. Once you get to C-16, you then have to take a bus shuttle, which then takes you to F. I look at the screen, we only have two minutes to make our connecting flight. I'm thinking there's nowhere we're going to make it, but we have to go for it. So I looked at my wife and kids. My children were eight and ten at the time. I said, all right, guys, let's start running. There we are now running through the airport. Have you noticed more people running through airports? Next time you see someone run by you in an airport, I want to encourage you to do what I do, cheer them on. I do, I cheer people on all the time. The other day this woman was running by me in the Alam port. I said, go, 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 I believe in you, you can do it. She was struggling. I mean, you could tell she hadn't run in a long time. I mean, she was doing her best. I don't, know, I don't mean that in a mean way, but she was really struggling. But as she ran by me, she gave me the thumbs up like this. I don't always get that response. I was in a LaGuardia in New York. I cheered this guy on. Yeah, I cheered this guy on LaGuardia. He gave me the finger. But it's all right. I turned a negative into a positive. I said, that's right. You're number one. So that was us. Now we're running through this airport. We're huffing and puffing. We're doing our best. And finally, we get to C-16. There are no bus shuttles there. Look at the watch. Five minutes to make our connecting flight. There's a woman who's handling all the buses. I said, how long did the buses get here? She said, four minutes. So my kids started crying. We're not going to make it. We're not going to make it. So I turned to them. I said, guys, you have to stay positive. You have to believe. We're going to make it. I'm telling you, we're going to make it. I turned to the woman. I said, we're going to make it, right? She said, you ain't going to make it. Finally, the bus arrives, we get on the bus, we get to Terminal F, it's the last gate. So now we're sprinting down Terminal F as fast as we can. I have to admit, I left my wife and kids in the dust. I was getting on that plane with or without them. And just as I arrived, <laughs> oh, that's not, just as I arrived, they slammed the door right in my face. I said, man, my wife and kids, they're on their way thinking that would help. She said, I'm sorry, so there's nothing I can do. I said, you don't understand, we have all these plans, all their flights are booked, we'll have to stay overnight in the airport, it will ruin everything, we have to get on this plane. She said, I'm sorry, so the plane is pushing back, look. My wife and kids arrive in that moment, we walk to the big window, we see the small plane, it's pushing back, and we are just so dejected. But as we're watching this plane, we realize that we can see into the cockpit, and then we realize that we can see the pilots. We realize that they can see us, we make eye contact. So my wife and kids start jumping up and down, waving to the pilots. <laughs> About a minute later, the door opens, a woman comes out, she says, it worked. <laughs> They're going to let you on the plane. <laughs> we walk down the stairs on the tarmac. They stopped the plane. The passengers weren't very positive. We take off, we land, another miracle occurred, our luggage made it too. A true miracle, I became a believer in God in that moment. And as we're driving away in the rental car, I think, okay, this is a great teachable moment for my kids. I said, so guys, what did you learn from this experience? I think they're going to say, you know, Dad, I want to stay positive, I learned to believe. And my year-old son said, you know, Dad, I want to just keep running. And when he said it, though, I thought, you know, there's so much truth to that. I looked at my wife, I said, you know. So often the key to success is that we just keep running. We stay positive and we never give up. The number one predictor and factor of success is grit. It's not talent, it's not title, it's not wealth, 
It's not good looks, it's grit. The ability to work hard for a long period of time towards a goal. To persevere, to overcome, to keep moving forward in the face of adversity, failure, rejections, and obstacles. And so life knocks you down, but grit keeps you moving forward. But if grit drives us, then what drives grit? Well, it's what we're talking about today. It's, it's having a vision of where you want to go. It's optimism. It's belief. And you know what? It's faith. Faith is so important because fear, I heard it said, is the second most powerful force in the universe because it's the one thing that will keep you from your destiny. You will have fear on this journey, but I want you to know this, that the fear and the negativity that you have do not come from you. This is really important for you to know because when I ask people, does it come from you? They say, yeah. I said, yeah. Who would ever choose to have a negative thought? No, it does not come from you. It comes from the enemy. It comes from the father of lies. And the enemy wants to sabotage you and your future. It wants to make you feel like that you're not good enough, strong enough. It wants to make you hopeless and fearful. But know this, just because you have a negative thought doesn't mean you have to believe it. Thank you. Thank you. Fear is a liar. Negative thoughts are lies. Don't believe the lies. Know the truth. And the truth is what God says about you. The truth is in God's Word. I think about Jesus in the wilderness, and the, de the devil tempted him. Every time the devil shared a lie, what did Jesus do? He responded with truth. He spoke truth to the lies. And we can do the same day in and day out. We must do the same. The best advice, best advice I ever heard, best advice I ever heard was from Dr. James Gills, the only person on the planet to complete six double Ironman triathlons, six double Ironmans, which means you do an Ironman, 24 hours later you do another one. And the last time he did it, 59 years old. I can't even swim the length of a pool. I asked him how he did it. He said, I've learned to talk to myself instead of listen to myself. He said, if I listen to myself, I roll the negative, all the fear, all the doubt, and all the complaints. But if I talk to myself, I can feed myself with the words and the encouragement that I need to keep on moving forward. He would memorize and recite scripture, and that's what fueled him on his race. You can speak truth to the lies. So when you're feeling stressed now, you can feel blessed. The research shows you can't be stressed and thankful at the same time. When you are facing a loss in your life, know that it stands for learning opportunity. Stay strong. When you fail, which you will, know that that failure does not define you. It's meant to refine you, to be all that you are meant to be. Don't believe the lie. Don't listen to the critic. Because critics do not know about your future. Critics do not know what is in your heart. Know that your positivity must be greater than all their negativity. I remember telling my dad I want to be a writer and speaker. I, I found my calling, dad. His response, what the heck you want to do that for? That's a load of junk. That won't amount to anything. He used other words. After a couple of years, I got on the Today Show. The show was called Get Energized Today. I remember flying up to New York to be on national television. I was terrified. I got to the green room, they sat me next to Queen Latifah. <laughs> Came my time to go be with Matt Lauer, I'm walking towards the door and I hear Queen yell, you go energy guy. So I went out there, I thought that was funny by the way. I went out there, I coached several people on enhancing their energy and their optimism for their work. And as I walked out of the studio, who called me but my dad. He said, your mother, I just saw you on TV, you really made a difference, we're so proud of you, we always knew you could do it. You know what? You will face negativity on the journey. Don't listen to it. Show up every day and just do the work. Keep showing up, doing the work. Repeat tomorrow. Stay positive. Show up and do the work. And then when you face that challenge, because every one of us has challenges day in and day out, know that every challenge is ultimately an opportunity. And your greatest challenges will lead to your greatest opportunities. When I graduated college. 22 years old. I didn't go right to Atlanta, I actually went to Houston first because there was a, a girl in Houston. 
There was a girl in Houston, and I was crazy about her. We met during the summer. I was interning in D.C. where she was as well. And so right after, right after college, get in my car, and now I drive from New York to Houston, a 24-hour drive. But halfway there, from Bristol, Tennessee, my car, my car caught on fire. <laughs> the engine exploded on the side of the road. I should have known right then and there that God was giving me a sign it wasn't going to work out. But I kept going there. I got a U-Haul, drove it down there. And then everything we had hoped for and talked about wasn't working out. We were fighting a lot. I didn't get into the law school I wanted to get into there. And it just wasn't going well. And I went up to her one day. I said, you know, I think I got to go home and figure some things out. She said, if you go home, then, then we're over. I said, I got to go home. So now I'm driving home, 22 years old, pitch black, 24-hour drive from Houston to New York. I'm on the lonely road. My heart is broken. Tears coming down my face. And I hear this song come on the radio, I'll do anything for love, but I won't do that. <laughs> from Meatloaf. <laughs> I got home. I'm waiting tables. All my friends are working on Wall Street. I feel like my life is going nowhere. I decided to go to Atlanta. To this day, I still don't know why I went to Atlanta. Actually, I do know why. God sent me there. Because when I opened up my own bar and grill, three weeks after opening, I was standing on the corner, and down the street, this woman was walking, and for me, it was love at first sight. For her, it took a few years. <laughs> but that woman would become my wife. And I think about that often, that if I just walked out of there just a minute later, or if she would have waited a minute, or, or five minutes, or would have came earlier, I wouldn't have seen her. Stay positive. God has a plan. And people often ask me, John, what would you tell your younger self? One of the things I would tell them is this. She's out there. Don't worry. You will find her. Stay positive. God has a plan. There's a formula I want to share with you, E plus P equals O. E plus P equals O. We can't control the events in our life, but we can have a positive response to those events, and so often that determines the outcome. Don't let your circumstances alter your faith. Let your faith alter your circumstances. And know that that E plus P equals O, that P also stands for purpose. We need a bigger purpose, because there are going to be days we get up, we don't feel very positive. There are going to be days we get up, we don't want to even get out of bed. And that's where we need a purpose to give us something to be positive about. See, God doesn't give us the plan for our life, but He does give us the purpose to fulfill it. And I know that you can't know your purpose without a relationship with the one who created you for a purpose. There is a reason why you are here. You are Blessed and given a purpose. And God gives each one of us a purpose because he created us for a purpose, to live that purpose and be on purpose. And one of the ways we also discover this purpose is by going out each day and living with purpose and just finding ways to love and serve and care. Love and serve and care. We honor God by loving and serving and caring. And I think about Jesus and I know that's what he did. He loved and served and cared. There's a great story about Lyndon Johnson, he was touring NASA. He came across a janitor who was cleaning up like the Energizer Bunny. He went up to the janitor, he said, I've never seen anyone clean like you. You're the best janitor I've ever seen. The janitor turned to the President of the United States and said, sir, I'm not just a janitor, I helped put a man on the moon. Because even though he was cleaning the floors and the halls of NASA, he saw his bigger purpose as putting a man on the moon. And then I was at a, a, a conference of bus drivers, and I was talking about the energy bus, of course. And this guy come up to me, came up to me afterwards, he said, John, I got to tell you this, I'm a local pastor of a small little church. I started driving a bus for the insurance benefits and the salary. But a funny thing happened after driving this bus for a few years. I realized I was having, having a bigger impact on people's lives as a bus driver than I was as the pastor of this church. Now that doesn't mean we're discrediting pastors here. Pastors make a huge impact. I love pastors. There are people that are called to be pastors. But what this gentleman taught me is that we don't have to go on a mission 
trip to be on a mission. That every day we can bring our mission, our purpose to the work that we do. And as we move towards Good Friday and Easter, I'm thinking about Jesus. I'm always thinking about Jesus, but more so this week. And Jesus had his purpose. He knew his purpose. And it was the ultimate story of hope, of forgiveness, and love. And when I think about that, I think about the disciples. I think about the disciples, how they felt on Friday. And then I think about how they felt on Saturday. Think about it. On Saturday, everything they believed in, everything that they hoped for, everything they longed for was now gone. It was destroyed, so they thought. And many of us probably feel like we're on Saturday right now. We might feel hopeless, depressed, sad. We're in between what happened and what's coming. We're uncertain about our future. But on Saturday, as the disciples were depressed and sad and hopeless, Sunday was coming. And Sunday came. Sunday came to the people who were hopeless on Saturday. And I want you to know that even if you're hopeless on Saturday, Sunday is coming. I want you to know that even if you feel depressed on Saturday, Sunday is coming. I want you to know that if you're worried about your future, Sunday is coming. I want you to know that if you're fearful about where you are, Sunday is coming. I want you to know that if you're you're dealing with a health problem, a relationship problem, some kind of challenge in your life, Sunday is coming. Stay positive because God has a plan. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you.